Well, good morning. I have a very long sermon prepared, so when we get out extra late, it's not my fault, it's Wes's fault. No, seriously, thank you, Wes. Appreciated your words. Today we are continuing, well actually are finishing our series, Stranger Texts. We've looked at four different or three different texts and stories so far. Uh, the first one we looked at was this passage that talked about Jesus uh, going to preach to spirits that were in prison. We looked at a story of God drowning the Israelites in quail meat. Last week we looked at, or uh, Rod Western preached about Ananias and Sapphira and the early Christian church and them getting zapped dead. These are some strange texts that, that seem to be upside down from what we know of, what we expect of God, what we think we understand Scripture to be teaching us. So today we're looking at our fourth one, uh, promises we shouldn't keep. And as we look at these texts, we, we've seen how on the surface they might be strange and bizarre, but they actually teach us a deep, important, significant truth about God and about our relationship to him. Today's story is no different. How many of you have ever made a promise that you have regretted? Anybody? Oh, all right. About half of you, maybe... Maybe half, the other half just don't feel like raising your hands this morning. Or maybe you're wiser than the other half of us. But I remember one time when I was 16 years old, my church decided to have a start, a new program. They had, wanted to have a day camp for the summer. And I was one of the counselors. And it was a, a good job. It was my first job, actually. And, and so I was really having a good time. But unfortunately, this summer day camp wasn't nearly as successful as they had hoped it would be. Many days, many weeks, the ratio of counselors to kids was one to one. And so the, the camp director began to ask the counselors individually if they were interested in f going on furlough, just, you know, not, uh, not continuing on for the summer, if they had other plans or wanted to do something else. And a couple of the counselors took her up on her offer, but when she asked me, I said, no, I, it's my first job, I, I'm enjoying it, I would like to, to stay on. And she said, okay, that's fine. She said, but all of the counselors that continue to work at this camp, they have to be fully committed. I said, sure, of course, I am, I am totally committed. I will not be distracted. This has my complete focus and dedication and attention for the rest of the summer. About a week after I made this promise, my mom comes to me and she said, Tyler, you know this trip I've been planning with my friend, the, this cruise to, to Northern Europe? Well, my friend can't go. Do you want to go with me? The problem being you're going to have to miss the last week of summer camp. And so immediately, my mind flashed back to this promise, this vow that I had made to the camp director that I was 100% totally committed. And I told my mom, no, I can't go. I've, I need to continue to work at the camp. And she, she tried to explain to me that it's going to be okay, that you know, it's not that big of a deal. Just come, you know, that the ticket has already been purchased just go. And I said, no, I've made this promise. And so that last week at camp, while my mom was visiting places like Norway and Denmark and Iceland, I was there at the summer camp with eight other counselors watching four kids. They would not have missed me in the least if I hadn't been there. And yet I missed out on this trip of a lifetime. And it's one of the regrets that I still have of, of not going on this amazing trip with my mom. We all have made promises. Some of us have regretted the promises, some of the promises we've made. And those promises that we've kept sometimes have cost us, cost us dearly. In fact, we read today of a story in Scripture of a promise that costs someone dearly. We find this story in Judges, chapter 11, starting with verse 1. 
It says, Jephthah was a strong soldier from Gilead. His father was named Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife had several sons. When they grew up, they forced Jephthah to leave his home, saying to him, you will not get any of our father's property because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah ran away from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. There, some worthless men began to follow him. It's interesting, right? He started to lead this group of worthless men. In other words, this is a biblical way of saying he became a gang leader out in Tob. And so Jephthah, he had been, been exiled and, and he found his way in this new land and, and he began to lead this gang. Well, come to find out, his, home, his homeland of Gilead began, began to be attacked by the kingdom of Ammon, which is the, the gold territory there on the map. And the Ammonites came, they started to attack and, and tried to, to conquer and, and claim some of the territory of Gilead. So the elders of Gilead, the leaders of Gilead said, we need some help. Someone needs to help us. Who can that be? Well, it's Jephthah. So they go to Jephthah and they say, come home, Jephthah. We, we need some help. We, we, you're this good warrior and you're, I guess you're a gang leader. So, so come on and help us. And Jephthah's like, wait, wait, didn't you kick me out? I thought you hated me. You sent me into exile. Now you want me to come back? And they're, oh, Jephthah, you're such a joker. Let bygones be got bygones. Come on home. Just, just come help us. So Jephthah responds in verse 9. He said, If you take me back to Gilead to fight the Ammonites and the Lord helps me win, I will be your ruler. In other words, Jephthah's saying, You know what? I'm not going to go back and just have you treat me like you did before. If I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back and be your ruler. And so the elders of Gilead said, Okay, that's fine come back, and, and, and Jephthah did, and they made him their leader and their commander of their armies. And so Jephthah, what he, the first thing he did, as he assumed leadership and the, the commander of the army, he sent a message, a letter, through a messenger, to the king of the Ammonites. And in this letter, he began to trace the history of the Israelites, how they claimed the promised land after they were set free from Egyptian slavery. He said, you know, when we came to this land, we didn't take any of your land. We didn't touch any of the land of the Ammonites. We took other land, and God gave us other land. So, so because we didn't take your land, stop trying to take our land. He was trying to strike a bargain with the king of the Ammonites. He, he had struck a bargain with, he struck a bargain with the, the leaders of Gilead. So he's like, well, let me try again and, and come to a, a, an agreement, a, a bargain with this, this other king. He said, we didn't take your land, so stop taking our land. And he concluded his letter with verse 24. Take the land that your God Chemosh has given you, and we will live in the land our Lord, the Lord our God has given us. Just be satisfied with what you have. We'll be satisfied with what we have and, and everything will be fine. But it wasn't fine. The king of the Ammonites didn't respond. He just ignored this, this deal that Jephthah was trying to make with him. So Jephthah said, thought to himself, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of one for two here with my bargaining skills. I, I bargained a good position with my hometown of Gilead, and, and I, I failed with bargaining with the, the king of the Ammonites, so, so I'm going to try one more bargain. I'm going to make a bargain with God. Verse 29 of the story continues, and it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord entered Jephthah. Jephthah passed through Gilead to the land of the Ammonites. And here Jephthah says, okay, now this is the time I need to bargain with God. And he made a promise to the Lord saying, if you will hand over the Ammonites to me, I will give you as a burnt offering the first thing that comes out of my house to meet me when I return from the victory. It will be the Lord's. So Jephthah says, all right, I, I've, I've made a bargain with God. And, and so here we go. And, and so they attacked the, the Gilead army attacked the Ammonite army and they were victorious. And in fact, they, they kept being victorious and, and they conquered over 20 cities of the Ammonites. 
And that should have been the end of the story, except for the bargain that Jephthah had made. When Jephthah returned home to his home in Mitzvah, his daughter was the first one to come out to meet him, playing a tambourine and dancing. She was his only child. He had no other sons or daughters. When Jephthah saw his daughter, he tore his clothes to show his sorrow because he remembered his vow. He remembered this promise that he had made that he was going to sacrifice the first thing that came out of his house. And so he sees that it's his daughter and he, he rips his clothes in sorrow And he said, my daughter, you have made me so sad because I made a promise to the Lord and I cannot break it. Ooh, what would you do if you were the daughter? Well, the daughter doesn't say, no, dad, how could you? And run away. She says, dad, well, you made this promise to God and and God gave you the victory, so... You're going to have to keep your promise. But, but give me two months to, to go into the hills, go into the mountains, and, and mourn the loss of my future, mourn the, the fact that I will never marry, that I will, all, that I will die a virgin. And, after, and Jephthah agreed, and verse 39 says, after two months she returned to her father, And Jephthah did to her what he had promised. Jephthah's daughter never had a husband. From this came a custom in Israel that every year the young women of Israel would go out for four days to remember, or some translations say to celebrate, the daughter of Jephthah. So what is going on here? Did did this really just happen, what what I think happened? Did, did, Did Jephthah really sacrifice his daughter? Did he really offer her as a burnt offering to God? I mean, how could this be? The the, the Bible says that that the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. So how could someone that has the Spirit of God on them do such a a horrific, horrendous, horrible thing? And and then if you read further in the Bible, the the Bible doesn't condemn Jephthah for doing this. He he just goes on to to do a few more things in his story, but, but there's no strong condemnation for this. And then, and thirdly, we think, well, how and why in the world would the, the other daughters of Israel make a tradition to come out and celebrate this every year? To, why would you celebrate such a horrific thing? Is something else going on there? Certainly, there it has to be something else happening here. And some scholars have said, yes, there's actually another option for us to, to read this story as. And that option is that it's not her life that's sacrificed, It's her virginity. It's the fact that she never marries. And they they present this option for a few reasons. The first being that Jephthah's vow gave him some options. See, when we read this vow here in verse 31, that key word is and. You know, that, that whatever comes out of the doors of my house, I will give to the Lord and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. But they say that that word and, the Hebrew word, could actually be translated as or. So it's it's not and, it's or. So he's saying if it's a human, then we'll dedicate it to the Lord, but or if it's an animal, we'll sacrifice it as a burnt offering. And you might wonder how in the world could an animal, why would he even think an animal would be coming out of his house? Well, here's a, a picture of what Israelite houses looked like back then. And you can see there was a room for animals in the front. And basically, that would be like what we would consider to be a garage in our days. You know, we, I don't think too many of us would say that the cars live in the house with us, right? But if you look at the structure, garages are part of our houses. And so they had a kind of a garage for their animals. And so it's a possibility that he was thinking, okay, well, animals and, and humans would come out of the door and so, but whatever comes out first, I will sacrifice. If it's an animal, I will sacrifice it on the altar. If it's a human, I will sacrifice it to the Lord. Meaning, what does sacrificing to the Lord mean? So they say it, it's that if it was a human to come out, they, that Jephthah would send that human to live and serve the tabernacle. If you're familiar with the story of Samuel, that's kind of what his mother did. 
you know, dedicated him to God and, and sent him to live at the, temp, at the tabernacle. And so they're saying that's what the vow is. If it was a human, Jephthah was saying, I will send that human to go uh, live at and serve the, at the tabernacle for the rest of that person's life. I'm dedicating it, him or her, to the Lord. The other reason, another reason why they think that she was sacrificing her virginity is that Jephthah knew the history and presumably the laws of Israel. That, that Jephthah, when he recounted that story the, of, of how Israel take, took possession of the promised land, he was aware of the history books. He knew the, the, how the, the broad strokes of, of the Israelite history, and he knew the details of the history. He knew what they conquered and when they conquered it. And so because he was so familiar with the Israelite history, that he must have also been very familiar with the Israelite laws. The law such as Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 31, which says, you must not worship the Lord your God the way other nation, nations worship their gods. For they perform for their gods every detestable act that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters as sacrifices to their gods. And this is repeated over and over throughout the, the laws of the Old Testament, that you are not to sacrifice your sons and daughters. So, so if Jephthah knew the history of Israel, he should be very well acquainted with the laws of Israel as well. So that's why we find no condemnation for Jephthah's actions because he didn't do it. He knew what the law said and so it would make no sense for him to actually sacrifice his daughter on an altar to God. And the third reason why scholars believe that this is a better option is that they translate the word, the Hebrew word Tanah to mean celebrate. In fact, some uh, scholars say that the reason why the women would go out to celebrate Jephthah's daughter is because she actually had made this choice herself. When Jephthah made this vow that he would sacrifice whatever came out of the house first, uh, she, she understood what he meant and that if it was a human that, that that person would be sent to live at the tabernacle and, and so she heard this vow, and so when she heard her father coming, she went out to meet him, knowing full well what that meant, because back then, women didn't really get to choose much of anything. They were basically like property. They, they went and they did what their fathers and then later husbands told them to do. And so here, she was taking agency for her life path. And so she made this choice herself. And so that's why the women would go out to celebrate the fact that Jephthah's daughter took control of her destiny as much as she could. But when you take these, these reasonings and you study them, that's obviously not the only option. The other option is what we commonly read is that she was sacrificed literally to death, not to the Lord, not uh, to, per to be per a perpetual virgin serving at the tabernacle, but that she really was killed on the altar. And so why do we believe that? Or why do some scholars believe that? Well, they think that Jephthah's vow actually gave him zero options. That, that key word and, while it could be translated as or, when you look at the Hebrew grammar, when you look at the context, it can only mean and that this daughter was being, that, that Jephthah was making the vow that whatever came out would be sacrificed as a burnt offering. Not two separate things, but it was connected. They also think that this is a better option because Jephthah wasn't really that knowledgeable. That just because he knew a little bit of the history doesn't mean that he really knew what was going on. This is a key verse. When he said, Take the land that your God, Chemosh, has given you and we'll live in the land that God has given us. The fact is, any of you know your ancient Near East history? No hands going up, right. So this doesn't jump out to many of us. The fact that Chemosh was not the God of the Ammonites. Chemosh was a God of the Moabites. It would kind of be like someone today confusing Zeus for Sheva or confusing Jesus with Muhammad, you know that that would not be an easy mistake to make if you even knew an ounce about, you know, the theology that was supposed to be going on. In fact, ironically, the, the God of the Ammonites was Molech, 
And if you know anything about Bible history, Moloch was the god that, that required human child sacrifice. And so here we see that, that actually Jephthah is really confused in a lot of things. As I read his story again, as I studied the story, it reminded me of this, the poem from Alexander Pope. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Dink, drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. There shallow drafts intoxicate the brain and drinking largely sobers us again. Because Jephthah, had, he had a little bit of knowledge. He, he knew his history. But it was a, a little bit is a dangerous thing in some context because you start to think you know everything when you know a little bit. It's only through deep studying and deep knowledge that you realize how little you do know and how much more you need to understand. So here Jephthah goes saying, oh, I know the history of Israel, and, and so, yeah, your God is Chemosh, and our God is Yahweh, but I don't, you know, he doesn't really know the details. And so it, it all kind of blows up in his face. The third reason that, that death is the better understanding here is that the Hebrew word tana actually means commemorate. A better translation is commemorate, not celebrate. It would be like saying on September 11 every year, a group of people go to New York City to go to Ground Zero to tana what happened. And they do, and, and they don't come, though. They don't come singing and dancing and, and eating tons of food, and it's not a carnival, right? It's a commemoration, when they come. They, they come to commemorate what had happened, the horrific thing that had happened there on September 11, 2001. The fourth is that Jephthah's daughter would not need two months to mourn her virginity. That was something that you would come to grasp, come to terms with in the course of your life, right? To know that, well, I'm never going to get married. I'm going to be living my life here at the temple. You wouldn't need to go out and mourn two months for this. But the real reason here that the problematic understanding with thinking that, that Jephthah's daughter was just sent to the temple was this. That if you remember earlier in Jephthah's story, he said his mother was a prostitute. And this is problematic. This is very problematic because according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 2, that means that Jephthah could not enter the assembly of the Lord. He could not go to the tabernacle, nor could his daughter nor any of his descendants until the 10th generation because he was the son of a prostitute. And so to think that his daughter could be dedicated to the Lord by spending her entire life in service at the tabernacle, it doesn't add up because this was against the laws, the laws that apparently Jephthah was not very well acquainted with. So why was she mourning? She went and, because she says, I need to go mourn the fact that I will never marry. The, I need to go mourn the fact that I will die a virgin. The fact is that, that death, while upsetting as that might be, back then, really, women's purpose in life was to have children. And so she was, she was understanding, she grasped the fact that she was going to die without ever having any kids. She was going to die without ever having her life have meaning. And so that is more upsetting if you know that you're coming to the end of your life on earth and you haven't fulfilled your purpose. And so this is why she goes into the, the, the mountains, the hills with her friends for two months to mourn the fact that she will never have lived up to what was expected of what she wanted to get and to give out of life. And so, we see that really the, the weight of evidence points to the fact that Jephthah really sacrificed his own daughter as a burnt offering to God. And this is maybe the most troubling story in all of Scripture because we wonder how, how can this even be? A God that is so very clearly against things, especially things like, like sacrificing your children. How could this story be found in Scripture? And it is troublesome. It is problematic. But the question that it really confronts us with this morning is how does his story reflect our story? And I know at, at first glance we think, not at all. I have never sacrificed my child 
to the gods on an altar. So how does this story of Jephthah reflect anything that I've experienced in life? And I think this is why we find some of these problematic stories in the Bible, these, these strange texts, because it's easy for us to, to dismiss them and think, oh, that's a, another story from another time that has no bearing on my life. But in actuality, the strangest of stories, this horrible story of Jephthah, I think can relate to many of us. We see here from his story this truth that hurt people hurt people. Jephthah came from a dysfunctional background, did he not? His father had a real family, but he had been birthed with a prostitute. And so there was this family drama that, that had caused pain and heartache and eventual exile. And so he was hurt. He was angry and bitter and manipulative and ignorant and abusive and selfish. And so he ended up taking it out eventually in the worst way possible on his daughter. Hurt people hurt people. How many of our stories have some dysfunction in them? I would imagine most of ours, to some degree or another, have some dysfunction in our history. How many of us struggle to, to restrain ourselves from hurting other people because of the hurt we've experienced. I think it would be wonderful, it would be amazing to say that Christians, specifically Seventh-day Adventist Christians, are never abusive. But that's not the case. In fact, chances are there's, there might be some of us here this morning that are abusive towards our spouse, towards our children, because of the hurt that we've experienced. And, and yeah, and I know we might dismiss and say, okay, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a little abusive. I might say some mean things. I might, might hit sometimes, but, but I'm ne I would never sacrifice anyone on an altar. But that same core that hurt, that pain that we see lived out in the life of Jephthah, it can lead to things that we don't ever expect it to. And so I encourage you today, perhaps, if you're wrestling with abuse in your life, to come get some help. Come talk to me confidentially. Come talk, go talk to, to someone else that can resource you with some, some help because we cannot keep that cycle of being hurt and hurting others. Because it, while it might not lead to someone being sacrificed on an altar, there's a high likelihood that it'll end in death just the same. Another thing that I think this story of Jephthah resonates with many of us in is in the fact that bad theology can lead to bad outcomes, that actually good theology can be life-saving. See, Jephthah, he didn't have a clear picture of God. He thought that he could bargain with God. He thought that, that he could sacrifice things to God and that, that it didn't matter, that, that, that he had this, this clouded understanding of who God was. He knew some, he knew a little bit of God, but he had a dangerous knowledge of God uh, uh, that because of that limitation. For example, he knew that he needed to keep his vow according to Numbers 30, verse 2. That's, it was an important thing to, to keep your promises. But he didn't know that God provided a way out. Leviticus 5, verses 4 to 6 is a key passage to this crazy story. It says this, If anyone makes a rash vow, whether the vow is good or bad, when he realizes what a foolish vow he has taken, he is guilty. He shall confess his sin and bring his guilt offering to the Lord, a female lamb or goat, and the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be freed from his sin and need not fulfill the vow. 
Here, Jephthah, if he had only really known what the scripture taught, if he had really only known the, the bigger picture of who God was, if he had really only known the details of the law, he could have not had to actually sacrifice his daughter. He could have realized the mistake he had made and brought a lamb to atone at the tabernacle instead. But he didn't know. And so he ended up making a horrific decision. And I think many of us are tempted, at least, to dismiss theology, to dismiss studying the deep things of God, the, the important things, the details of God, because we think, oh, you know what? I, I already know all of that. I, I know the gist. I know that Jesus died and he loves me and so I'm saved. I, that's it. That's all I need to know. So why even bother reading any of the other stuff? In fact, I've heard a couple of you say to me that you found basically this sermon series to be a waste of time because I didn't know about these crazy stories in the Bible. I didn't pay attention to them, and I'm not going to pay attention to them later. So why bother wasting my time, Pastor? But that's the mindset that's, that people, many people have when it comes to the Bible. That They think, oh, it's okay, I just, I just need to know the little bit and I can dismiss the rest of it. The rest of it doesn't make a difference to me. But when we do that, when that's the approach we take to Scripture, we end up missing out on the complete picture of who God is. We end up with a warped, twisted, uh, not fully developed theology. And that can have horrific consequences. And another way I think this story reflects in our experience is that Jephthah felt that God owed him. But in reality, God didn't owe him a thing. Jephthah felt that he had struck a bargain with God, that he had managed to take some, have some leverage over God, that, that he could dictate what God would do if only he had said the right words, done the right thing, made the right vow, the right sacrifice. But we find that that's not how God operates. Yes, God did give Jephthah and his army the victory, but he helped Israel in spite of Jephthah, not because of him. He helped Israel out of grace not because he had been promised a crazy sacrifice. And so many times I think we often have that same mindset of, of, oh, I can get leverage on God, I can do something for him, I can do this, give that, say this, and, and then he's going to owe me. He owes me as a Christian, doesn't he? He owes me to, to restore my health. He owes me to improve my finances. He owes me to, to fix these broken relationships that I have because I'm a Christian. He doesn't, he doesn't owe the non-believers anything, but he owes me something because I'm a believer. I mean, look, I, I come to church. I sacrifice my time. I, I, I sacrifice my finances. I put tithe and offerings in the, in the plate. I, I do this for him. I do that for him. So the God owes me. In reality, God owes us nothing. It gives us grace. And I know it's troublesome It's painful to see part of our life experience, part of our story, part of our thoughts and our, part of our feelings reflected in this horrific story of Jephthah who sacrificed his own daughter. And we think, can I, I, I really have anything in common with this man who did such an abomination, such an abominable thing? And the answer is yes. Yes, we do have things in common with Jephthah. But there is good news. Hebrews chapter 11 is this chapter called the, the Hall of Faith where it lists these, these heroes of the Bible. And we read here this passage in verses 32 and 33. It says, well, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. And Jephthah? 
And David and Samuel and all the other prophets, these people all trusted God and as a result won battles, overthrew kingdoms, ruled their people well and received what God had promised them. Here we see this list of people that, that were heroes. And we see Jephthah's name included, along with the names of David, a man after God's own heart, and Samuel, this pillar of Jewish history. And I think, how can this be? And we don't know. We don't know why actually Jephthah ended up being included in this list. But we do know that Gideon, he tended towards idolatry. We know that David committed adultery. We know that Samson visited prostitutes. We know that even that all of these people listed in this hall of faith had problems. We know that Jephthah sacrificed his own daughter. And yet, despite their sins, because of their faith, they were covered by God's grace. Despite all of their shortcomings, despite all of the wicked things that they did, because they ultimately placed their faith in God, he covered them with his grace. And if God's grace can cover someone who sacrificed his own daughter, how much more can God's grace cover you and me this morning? Friends, I know that all of us are sinners, that we all have done things that, that cause us to fall short of God's glory. But I also know that just like Jephthah, if we put our faith in God, he will cover us with his grace as well. This morning, do you want to place your faith in God? This morning, do you want to receive that grace that God is ready and willing to pour out upon you? This morning, do you want your name to be listed in the records of faithful followers of Christ? I invite you to stand this morning if you are wanting to accept and claim the promise of Christ of salvation, to claim the grace that he offers to give, to claim this hope that we all will be saved when he returns. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you see us standing in commitment to you. Lord, we are making this vow this morning to accept your promise of salvation through faith. It is not a rash vow. It is not a foolish vow that, that has been made like Jeff does. Lord, instead we are standing this morning because we want your goodness in our lives. We want to experience your grace and your healing and your salvation. And so, Lord, as we stand here this morning, help us to continually put our faith in you and you alone. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.